If you're in a Final Destination movie, your best hope of surviving is to look for the signs. Right from the opening credits, there are signs of impending danger, like the scissors pointed at Kimberly's head in this photo, or the blade directed at her face right next to that. Kimberly has an eye on her keychain, a clue that she will be the clairvoyant whose vision saves the lives of several people. And when she first wakes up that afternoon, the time is 1.08, an anagram of 180 referencing the flight number of the big accident from the first movie. There would be many other appearances of the ominous number 180, as well as many other signs that often go unnoticed. To hear about every last secret, stick around to the end of this video. This video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Welcome to Things You Missed, and if you're watching on Upload Day, Happy Halloween. This year's Halloween may not be what we're used to, but hopefully you found a way to enjoy it. Final Destination 2 brought in a new director. James Wong handed it over to David R. Ellis, who is mostly known for his work in the stunt department, so the result was one really cool spectacle at the beginning of the movie, but a lot of weird stuff for the rest of the film. Man with hooks. I, I think I see a man with hooks. We'll get into that, but first, let's get into the things you missed. You missed it? Oh. Kimberly first wakes up at the beginning of the movie when she hears a strange voice utter her name. Kimberly. I believe this is the voice of the coroner, William Bloodworth, who later somehow knows her name when Clear brings her to the morgue to ask questions about death, suggesting that William could be much more than a creepy dude who knows a lot about death. This is effectively the first sign that she actually notices about the tragedy that would become known as the Route 23 pileup. The next is when her door suddenly closes. In the past, we've seen that death is often associated with the wind. Her and her friends are headed off to a road trip to Daytona Beach, a parallel to the first movie where Flight 180 is also a travel-related accident. When she drives away, her car is leaking transmission fluid that almost looks like blood. In our Flight 180 analogy, the equivalent of the airport terminal would be the highway on-ramp. And just as Alex is disturbed by a creepy missionary, Kimberly is startled by a creepy old woman collecting trash, which her friend Dano finds way funnier than it actually is. <laughs> Okay. They get on the highway and see a school bus transporting a sports team. There's a banner that says, Demolish the Mustangs, Smoke Their Butts. And later down the road, they would encounter a Ford Mustang with smoke coming out of the butt. And it gets demolished in the accident. We see the bus for realsies after the premonition and learn that it's a bus from Mount Abraham High School, which is the school whose French class fatally boarded Flight 180. Alex Browning encountered a couple references to hell and demons before boarding that plane. And when Kimberly changes the radio station, ACDC's Highway to Hell starts playing, which coincidentally, I I used to sing every day in sixth grade on my way to English class. Dino tosses his illegal substance joint out the window, and it lands on the windshield of a woman named Kat, where it burns some leaves that are stuck there. This could either be a sign of the fiery explosions caused by the pileup, or any of the other four fiery explosions in this film. The real scariest part of this movie is just the fact that like 50% of the people on this road are driving under the influence. I mean, between Kat, Rory, and this truck driver, it's a wonder that it took five whole minutes for a major accident to occur. By the way, the drinking driver represents a company called called Heiss Pale Ale, a reference to stunt coordinator Freddie Heiss. You probably didn't miss the weird kids smashing together the toy cars. I mean, who does that? But what you may not have noticed is that it's a red truck crashing into a big blue commercial vehicle, which is not only what happens at the end of Kimberly's vision, but also what happens for real when Kimberly loses her friends after stepping out of her vehicle. The truck that starts the big pileup in Kimberly's vision has a loose wire hanging off the back of it, which brings back memories of the end of the first movie, where a similar wire almost caused the death of the main characters Clear and Alex. This truck also also has a familiar license plate, VKY722. We last saw this plate in my Things You Missed episode on Stephen King's Misery, where it was the license plate of Paul Sheldon's car, and I mentioned that it's appeared in many movies, like The Freshman, Shaft, and The Wolf of Wall Street. Finally, after the premonition when the real accident occurs, Kimberly looks up and sees a sign that says, Warning, work ahead. Next 180 feet. This is the number 180 resurfacing as it has so many times since Flight 180, as I discussed when I covered the first movie. The new number added to the mix this time is the number 23. Kimberly notices that the next service station is 23 miles away after her dad calls her to warn her about her car's leak. Final Destination 2 is pretty much the same exact movie as the first, with one key difference. This time, William Bloodworth tells them that the only way to defeat death is with new life. And so the majority of this film is spent trying to make sure nothing bad happens to this woman, Isabella, so she can safely deliver her baby and theoretically force death to completely reset its list. There's a scene later on where we learn that each character is connected by the fact that they should have died at some point over the last year, but each of them missed their appointment 
threatened with death because of one of the Flight 180 survivors. At the end, Isabella is revealed not to have been on death's list yet, but that doesn't mean she isn't connected to the others. We first see her in the Premonition, driving her white van, which has a logo for Fresh and Fast Florist. In other words, she's delivering flowers, and I think the reason she's there is because she's delivering to the one-year anniversary memorial at Mount Abraham High School that we hear about on the radio. A candlelight vigil to mark the one-year anniversary of the crash of Flight 180 will be held at 8 p.m. tonight at the Mount Abraham High School Auditorium. After the premonition, there's even a part where she asks to get through because she has to make a delivery. Excuse me, is there any way that we could drive around? I have a delivery. But you need to get back into your vehicles. I think that fate had her making this delivery because Death wanted Clear to be lured out of hiding and needed her to end up at the Lakeview Hospital when Eugene's room exploded. It's all part of Death's design. But there would be many more accidents before then, each with their own clues to uncover. The holiday we've been waiting for all year has finally arrived. And if you're like me, you found something scary to enjoy at home this year because of COVID-19. And if you're like me, you're looking to keep things scary all year round. Something that I've been enjoying to fill that Halloween void is Hunt a Killer's Blair Witch Game. It's basically a subscription box that puts you in the center of a new horror mystery taking place in the universe of one of the greatest found footage movies of all time, The Blair Witch Project. Each season consists of six episodes. When you open the box, you'll receive your case file, which consists of realistic evidence. We're talking journals, police reports, maps, and other documents that'll help you solve the mystery of Black Hills Forest. If I could compare it to anything, I'd say it really has the feeling of an escape room. It's very hands-on and makes you a character in the story. There are certain parts where you make a revelation and it's just genuinely creepy and unsettling. Right now, for things you missed viewers, you can go to huntakiller.com slash CZsWorld and use code CZsWorld for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use code CZsWorld for a 20% discount and to show your support for the show. Can you survive the curse of the Blair Witch? There's a running theme of luck and chance in Final Destination 2. The dice hanging from Rory's mirror represent chance. The police chief considers each of the survivors to be very lucky, especially Evan Lewis, who won the lottery the previous day. I'm lucky. Before getting crushed by a falling ladder. Walking under a ladder is considered bad luck, and so are black cats. During Evan's incident, he tries cooking lunch for himself using black cat cooking oil. And Evan's new ring is a horseshoe ring, which is considered to be a lucky charm. Also, that's the only reason that the Colts won the Super Bowl in 2007. The number 13 is considered to be the unlucky number, and it can be seen on Eugene's billiard ball keychain. This ball starts a chain reaction that nearly gets someone killed. When we first see this ball on his keychain, Eugene is also the 13th accident survivor on death's list. Officer Burke is a policeman who is part of Unit 13. Unit 13 requesting medical assistance. Let's go practice medicine. The first individual accident seen in the movie is Mr. Lucky himself, Evan Lewis. We see him after he's used some of his lotto money to buy expensive stuff. In the hallway outside of his apartment, there are a number of signs, a pileup of toy cars and vehicles that was probably his first sign about the incident on Route 23. He nearly steps on a toy ambulance that says Mount Pleasant on the side, which is identical to the ambulance that picks him up after his accident. He nearly falls after stepping on this one-eyed baby doll, which isn't a Toy Story reference, it's an omen about Evan's eventual fates where the fire escape ladder punctures his right eye. There's another clue about that in his kitchen, where the refrigerator magnets seem to spell out hey, but the H falls away. Think of a ladder as a bunch of H's stacked on top of one another, and the result is the word I, which is what gets poked out when that ladder falls. And the new computer he buys is an iMac. Not a nose Mac, not a chin Mac, an iMac. The song he puts on is called Vitamin by the band Incubus, who are named after the Latin-derived word which refers to a male demon, another one of the demonic references I mentioned earlier. It goes along well with his demon tail necklace. He also has this monkey demon statue sitting by his window, which is next to a miniature version of his 1979 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am, which you may remember had a phoenix decal on its hood. He also has the Firebird image on his front door. These are all signs that he's going to start a fire in his apartment, which ultimately leads him to his death. The mozzarella sticks he cooks are from a company called Surefire Snack which sure enough is the catalyst of that apartment fire. I would also say that this Incubus song is fire, but uh, they wouldn't have called it that back then, so I'm just not gonna count that one. I'm just surprised they didn't use Pardon Me. A decade ago, 
After Evan's over-the-top ending to depth perception, Officer Burke looks up some more info on Flight 180 and comes across a website about plane crash survivors, which has photos of each of the survivors. And for some reason, the photo of Todd is captioned as a nice shot before the coroner arrived. What's nice about that? It's a dead 17-year-old. Also, I noticed that their high school photos are almost definitely taken from the photo shoot for the Final Destination 1 poster and just given a different background. Various characters learn the news of Evan's death, including Kat, who is smoking on the treadmill? I mean, what's the point of that? It would be like if I made a video and didn't upload it. But there is an interesting painting near Eugene's TV of what seems to be a person with their legs severed from the rest of their body. A hint about Rory, who later gets his legs cut off by the wire fence. The child, Tim, is reading Stephen King's Bag of Bones before bed, which is a novel about a writer who has disturbing dreams and visions, much like Kimberly does in this movie. Speaking of Kimberly, she has a few interesting items of her own that I haven't mentioned yet because they're connections to things outside of this movie. For example, one of the first things we see in her room is a puppet, which I think was a reference to a cut line from Mr. Bloodworth that can only be seen in the deleted scenes. But be warned, to disrupt the grand design is to unravel the tapestry of the universe. And when you pull those threads apart, you might find yourself hanging. I also noticed a picture of a bridge in her room, which of course makes me think about the opening disaster in Final Destination 5, even if it wasn't an intentional reference at the time. There's also a clown on a trapeze in her room, makes me think of another scene from the fifth one. There's another link to a later movie in the franchise when Nora takes her son to the dentist's office, and a fish gets stuck in the filter. We see a very similar accident happen in the fourth movie. Before that happens though, Kimberly goes to talk to the only remaining Flight 180 survivor, Clear. There's a lot more info here about what happened to Clear in between Final Destination 1 and Final Destination 2, so I did a whole video on it, which you can check out right here if you're interested. There are also some names written on the side here. The first three are Flight 180 victims, who, if you've seen my episode on the first movie, you know are named after crew members. The other two names aren't credits, but they appear to be other Hollywood connections. For example, this guy worked on the butterfly effect, which is written by the same guy who did Final Destination 2, so I think these could have been other Flight 180 victims whose names were just off screen here. One headline that caught my attention was this one, Hollywood jumps on Flight 180 bandwagon. So does that mean that the movie Final Destination also exists within the universe of Final Destination? Is that what they're saying here? After talking to Clear and seeing some birds in a window reflection, Kimberly makes this conclusion. If Clear's right about the order, then uh, Nora and Tim are, are gonna be attacked by pigeons. Okay, that's, uh, that's a pretty big jump to make, but whatever. But that leads us to the next disaster scene, which starts when we see a skull in the fish tank. The first clue that somebody is gonna die here. The next clue cannot be seen, but only heard. The music playing in the waiting room is a MIDI cover of John Denver's Rocky Mountain High, the song that showed up over and over before the disaster in the first movie. I'm gonna crank up the volume and roll it. The doctor's ready for you now. In the dentist's office, there are tanks of nitrous oxide and oxygen used for laughing gas. This could be seen as a foreshadowing of the explosive oxygen tanks that kill Clear and Eugene at the end of the movie. The way Tim dies really doesn't make any sense to me. Like, he sees it, but he doesn't try to move. No one would have that reaction if they see something falling on them. But Tim's death, as ridiculous as it may seem, is nowhere near as outlandish as his mother's. Death would arrive for her not long after. Here are a couple more things I love about Hunt a Killer's Blair Witch Box, the lore. This isn't just a generic game of Clue with a Blair Witch logo slapped on it, they've actually partnered with the studio, Lionsgate, to make something that fits into the Blair Witch universe. Everything they send you feels like it belongs in a Blair Witch movie, so everything feels very immersive. If you love things you missed, you'll love looking out for those little clues. It's a great feeling whenever you unlock a new discovery. The flexibility. There are so many different ways you can play. I mean, I had a fun time just playing by myself. But there are so many clues and materials, you could easily team up with a partner or roommate or even get a small group together for a little team think sesh over video chat. Unlike most ARGs, you're not just staring at a screen the whole time. So it's kind of perfect for someone like me who has a job where you're just staring at a screen for 16 hours a day. You're going to be getting a 20% discount using my link, which you can find in the description. That's huntakiller.com slash CZsWorld and use code CZsWorld for 20% off.
In my previous episode, I mentioned how a lot of Final Destination characters are named after great classic horror filmmakers, and Final Destination 2 is no exception. Kimberly Corman and her dad, Mr. Corman, are named after Roger Corman. Evan Lewis is named after Herschel Gordon Lewis, and Nora and Tim Carpenter are named after John Carpenter. Tim's dentist is named Dr. Lees, which could be in honor of Christopher Lee, one of the most iconic actors to play Dracula, and on Burke's computer screen, you can spot an incident report on Barker Avenue, possibly a nod to Clive Barker. After the construction crew discovers that little Timmy isn't a load-bearing wall, Clear joins back up with Kimberly and Burke to take them to William Bloodworth and try to get some answers. Wait, look at this. Is Bloodworth an apostasy fan? Good for him, I always thought he was kind of metal. Clear's alertness prevents a possible explosion at the gas station afterwards, which would only be a temporary dodge because, as I mentioned, she does end up dying by explosion. Actually, kind of a lot of people do in this movie. It is there that they figure out Mr. Bloodworth's cryptic clue. A brand new soul that was never part of Death's design. It throws the whole list out of whack and we start over with a clean slate. Seems like a bit of a reach, don't you think? Yes, thank you. This is where the movie completely turns into... Uh, I mean, basically a joke. They already tried the whole pregnancy thing where new life that was never meant to be can force death to start over in the first movie. They were gonna have Clear get pregnant and then have Alex's baby, but then they showed it at test screenings and it didn't go over well. The whole baby thing they didn't like. It was part of the way that Alex and Clear didn't work and they didn't buy the baby at the end. They thought it was goofy and wasn't satisfying enough. So why in the f did they decide to try it again in the second movie? It makes no sense. So they look back at Burke's cop car cam to try to find out who Isabella is, and it just kind of shows you how sloppy the movie is. According to the camera, it's 9.12 a.m. when they're on the ramp, but when it happened the first time, it was about 8.16 a.m., and then when we see it again in the premonition, it's 8.24 a.m., and it gets much worse at the meeting that Burke hosts for the Route 23 survivors because Rory just completely forgets about personal boundaries on the elevator. You got something on it. Bro, here, yeah, I can get it for you. No, it's, a, it's all right. Just let, I'll, let me do it. Very weird, but also, did you notice the elevator music? It's a little hard to tell, but there's an elevator music version of Rocky Mountain High. I'm gonna play back that exact part. Just let, I'll, let me do it. So they have the meeting and Eugene is just denying the whole death curse thing. I honestly don't even know why he came to the meeting because he just mocks them the entire time and then he leaves. Clear explains that they need to be looking for signs and the rest of them try to safe proof the apartment like Alex did to Clear's cabin in the first movie. Nora and Eugene get into the elevator with this weird guy and to this day, I still don't understand why he's holding the stuff or like what it even is. Are we supposed to understand what's going on here even? A man with hooks. What do you think they're gonna say? Oh my god, he's right. Oh my god, he's right. No, come on. I was kidding. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Was it not already weird enough that this guy, who we've never seen before, is holding a bunch of limbs with hooks on them? Just pause it right there. So they try calling Nora to warn her about the man with hooks. So let's break down this phone call. Hello? Nora! Who is this? Okay, so this establishes that she doesn't know who's calling. Rather than just saying, it's Officer Burke, he just starts screaming. Nora, can you hear me? Even though she's given no indication that she's having trouble hearing up to this point. Uh, Officer Burke, I can't... I I can't hear you, what? Well, if she can't hear him, then how does she now know who's calling? And he still hasn't said who's calling. A man with hooks is gonna kill you. So she just drops the phone, not asking what that means, not asking for more details, not asking for elaboration, and then she immediately dies. <laughs> There's more, like Eugene running upstairs and suddenly having a meltdown where he tries to shoot himself, but all the bullets are duds, supposedly because it's not his turn to die. So are we just supposed to believe that he's invincible until the others die? I mean, that makes no sense. Because if that's the case, just keep Kat in the padded room and send Eugene out to do the rest of the tasks. If they do that, then they've essentially won. But yeah, it seems like they do have to die in order because later on, there's this part where Death knocks down this tree branch to move Burke out of the way so that he doesn't get killed by the flying fence that kills Rory. So with that in mind, the plan that makes the least sense is sending 
them all in the car together with Kat, who is next on the list as the driver. <laughs> so naturally, that's exactly what they do. So at this point, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to calm down and then uh, we can hopefully get through the rest of this movie and the rest of the things you missed. In the episode on the first Final Destination, I pointed out how all of the disasters manufactured by death were somehow related to water or liquid. And that trend continues for most of the accidents in Final Destination 2. In the opening disaster, the Route 23 pileup, we can see that the ground is wet and water is spraying off of everyone's tires. Obviously that prevented the cars from braking when they should have, which helps make the disaster worse, but perhaps even more dangerous than that is what goes on in Nora and Tim's car. When we first see them, Tim is drumming on the glove compartment with a couple of water bottles. And when the pileup occurs, one of them falls under Nora's brake pedal, so she's unable to stop her car from smashing into what's ahead of them. Evan's fatal scene doesn't really have any water, but I will note that things start going really bad for him when he gets his hand stuck in the garbage disposal in his sink. Tim's accident occurs at the dentist, starting with when the fish tank springs a leak out onto the electrical outlet. Nora's death doesn't really involve water at all, but it's shown to be raining during that scene. Kat's death is not a result of water, she's killed when her airbag pushes her into a sharp object, but Rory's death is the result of a punctured fuel tank that drips into a storm drain, eventually causing a news van to explode and launch a bar barbed wire fence at him. Then there's Kimberly, who has this plan at the end that she's gonna die and then be resuscitated, and she does this by driving an ambulance into the lake. The two that I haven't mentioned yet are Eugene and Clear, who both die in an explosion that has nothing to do with water. But you have to consider the reason that they're there in the first place is because Isabella, the pregnant woman, has her water break. Seems like a bit of a reach, don't you think? Maybe, Burke, maybe. But that water break scene just has some of the best acting that I've ever seen in a movie. My water, it just broke, I'm gonna have my baby. No, not here. No, you can't do this to me. Don't just stand there. Get me to a hospital. Just give me a second to think. Um. Wow. Just incredible. Incredible performance. I mean, how did this not win Best Supporting Actor and Actress? So realistic. So captivating. Incredible job! Okay, I don't want to just spend this whole episode just ragging on a movie. I do really like the concept how all of the Route 23 people had their lives extended because the Flight 180 survivors lived longer than they were supposed to. I just don't get this part. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. Who are these people? People who got off of Flight 180. They were my friends. Hold up. Hold on a second. Let's uh, rewind to the first movie because I certainly do not remember them being your friends, Clear. Um, nobody forced you off the plane. You said you weren't friends with those that were. So, Clear, why did you get off the plane? Because I saw and I heard Alex. Like, I get that she became friends with Alex and Carter at the end of the movie, but she can't act like she was friends with all of them. And by the way, what is this picture placed in her little padded room? This has never happened. They were literally fighting with Terry and Carter the moment before Terry died. There is no point where this picture could possibly exist. Why are you trying to rewrite the history of the first one? I don't want to be too negative. I mean, there are actually some good scenes in this movie. And if I die, um... She throw down my drugs and... My paraphernalia, my porno. Anything that's gonna break my mom's heart. You know, that's actually like a really heartfelt moment. I mean, that makes me want to root for this guy to survive and get his life together. But unfortunately, he's dead one minute and 34 seconds later. Not long after, we find out that the entire objective of this movie was a lie because Isabella was never supposed to die in the pileup in the first place and Kimberly has another vision and sees a new sign in an article that says new life for drowning victim. If you read the article, it seems to be about another final destination like event where these two guys just happen to be at the right place at the right time to save this woman who would nearly drown. One of them is quoted in the article. I wanted to stop at the corn dog shop, which is on the other side of the hospital, but Paul said, no way, we're going to Dumpy's. In two years, we've never gone to Dumpy's. I don't know how to account for why we suddenly changed our plan. It sounds like maybe one of them had a vision or saw a sign that influenced their behavior, just like every Final Destination opening. And in true Final Destination fashion, these two guys are named after the crew members of the movie. So as I mentioned, Kimberly drives into a lake and is brought back by the paramedics. Ready? Clear! No, no, you got it all wrong. Clear's the dead one. This is Kimberly. The final scene is this dinner scene with the family of the farmer whose land they crashed on when their tires blew out. So they run a car into this dude's farm, cause all kinds of havoc and trouble, nearly get his son run over by a news van, and he responds by trusting them with his truck when they just met and inviting them over for dinner. In any event, way back towards the beginning of this video, I mentioned all of the references to luck, chance, and misfortune. And when the farmer's wife learns of how her son narrowly avoided getting hit by a van, thanks to Rory's intervention, she speaks the final line of the movie. You never told me that, Peter. Boy, that was lucky. 
Click the video on the left for the next episode of Final Destination Things You Missed. And if you love horror, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. And if you want to beat death, use a face mask and social distancing.